Hello and welcome to the State of the Fleet Industry, a weekly video series produced by Automotive Fleet Magazine. I'm Mike Antich, editor of Automotive Fleet, and today I'd like to examine what's occurring in the fleet industry for the week of June 6th, 2022. And for this week's episode, I'd like to continue my examination of the 2023 model year ordering cycle, which continues to be pressured by extremely heavy order volumes. And without a doubt, Today's demand for fleet vehicles has never been greater, primarily because of the large pent-up demand that's been created over the past two model years due to the difficulty in sourcing replacement vehicles. And the recent announcements of the immediate cutoffs to fleet ordering at the very start of the 2023 model year ordering cycle has only added to the ongoing uncertainty being felt by fleet managers. And here's what one fleet manager uh, said, responding to my last week's video report on how strong fleet demand has triggered the closure of several order banks 24 hours after their opening. Quote, I was so close. I anticipated the order banks would close within days, but not within one day. End of quote. And just last Wednesday on June 1, another closure of an order bank for 2023 models was announced. And on that day, GM announced an immediate cutoff for the U.S. fleet orders for the 2023 Chevrolet Traverse and the 2023 GMC Acadia due to heavy order volumes. And what's different with this announcement than the past order bank closures is that the Traverse and Acadia order banks have been open since March 24, 2022. But anecdotally, it appears that with the earlier closure of these other order banks, it caused some fleets to pivot and redirect their fleet orders to the Traverse and Acadia, which were available on a free flow order basis, thereby amplifying their order volume and selling out their fleet allocation earlier than anticipated. But the overall industry trend is moving towards the adoption of a controlled allocation system by ordering fleet vehicles, at least for the near term. And while controlled allocation ordering programs will guarantee that fleets will be allocated a specific number of vehicles, in all likelihood, it still means that fleets will not get all of the vehicles they want to order. And this promises to further add to the pent-up fleet demand that will carry over into the next model year. And the latest variation in controlled allocation is the move to a quarterly allocation system with orders placed on a quarter to quarter basis and it's designed to provide fleets with a more accurate expectation of fleet deliveries that they can anticipate. So depending on how you differentiate a model, my count is that there are almost two dozen models whose 2023 order banks are now closed and this is only June 6th. One fleet professional very succinctly summarized today's state of affairs by saying, quote, we're in for another wild ride, end of quote. And it's so true, but there's also been a lot of other news that's been generated in this past week that will likewise have a big impact on the fleet industry and that merits coverage in this report. So let me address each of these developments in a bullet point by bullet point summary of each topic. So the first topic is industry consolidation. In a speech given on June 1 at the Bernstein Strategic Decisions Conference, Jim Farley, Ford Motor Company CEO said the transition to electric vehicles will force a major consolidation among automakers and suppliers in the years ahead. And he added that the massive amount of capital needed to invest in these and other technologies will force smaller companies to be acquired. Plus, there'll be pressure on many electric vehicle startups, some of whom are already running into cash flow issues as their initial funding dries up. And just last week on Friday, May 28th, Electric Last Mile Solutions, or ELMS as it's commonly known, warned that it may run out of cash by the end of June unless it can raise additional capital. And they may not be the only EV startup to be facing a cash flow crunch during this formative startup period. But for the vibrancy of the emerging EV industry, let's hope that they and the other EV startups are successful in getting their additional funding to prove whether or not their products are viable in the open marketplace. Another noteworthy comment that was made last week 
was made by Carlos Tavares, the CEO of Stellantis, who said that despite the impressive expansion of battery manufacturing in North America, and there's 13 uh, new battery plants going up in addition to the existing infrastructure we already had in this country. But despite all this, he still expects constraints in the EV supply chain this decade due to the large number of new EVs that will go on sale in the North American market. And one example of this EV product proliferation was the recent announcement by Buick that it does not plan to launch any internal combustion engines after 2024 and will stop selling gasoline powered vehicles by 2029 when it becomes an all EV brand similar to Cadillac. So who's going to be buying all of these EVs? Well, Last week, J.D. Power released its electric vehicle consideration study, and according to the report, the biggest factors as to whether someone purchases an EV is if they are an existing homeowner, which makes sense because home, as a homeowner, you have greater freedom in installing a home EV recharging system. In fact, only 17% of the people who rented said they would very likely consider purchasing an EV. And again, that makes sense also because as a renter, you're going to be required to get a landlord's approval to install a recharger. Otherwise, you'll be relegated to public recharging stations, which may or may not be your home or uh, may or may not be near your home or work. The other finding from the J.D. Power study is that there is a correlation between household income and EV purchase considerations. In other words, the more money you have, the greater the likelihood that you'll purchase or consider acquiring an EV. And in my mind, this reinforces my contention that you need to have a strong resale market for used EVs, especially in the early stages of the industry's transition to being primarily an EV automotive market. So you ask yourself, who is a typical buyer of used vehicles? Well, it's often someone who's a renter, someone who has a lower household income. And these are the very people who the J.D. Power study says are showing the lowest consideration in purchasing an EV. And I know that used EV and the used EV market is being discussed among OEMs and within the remarketing industry but I believe the automotive industry needs to develop a greater urgency in developing strategy to ensure that there'll be a robust market for secondhand EVs. And when I think back on it, when I first entered the market in, or entered this industry in 1985, retail leasing of new vehicles was just starting to proliferate and there was talk of the emergence of a used vehicle leasing market, but it never happened for a variety of reasons. But I asked myself, might it be time to revisit this? Might the creation of a flexible used EV leasing program address some of the EV affordability issues for used vehicle buyers? And secondly, if you structure a lease for a used EV as a closed-end lease, where the lessee can walk away from the vehicle at the end of the lease term, might this address some of the issues as to who will be ultimately responsible for a depleted battery? So, things to think about. So with this as my final observation, I'd like to conclude my State of the Fleet Industry presentation for the week of June 6, 2022. And I'd like to thank you for watching.